Now we're doing a solo podcast today, a solo cast on Socratic interviewing, aka how to become an obnoxious person who people don't want to be around in social situations. Um, but uh, but really a, a potentially helpful way to to get clients, employees, etc., to actually learn stuff rather than just having you talk relentlessly at them, sort of like I'm about to do in this podcast, which is kind of a, a an ironic twist here that we're um, discussing Socratic interviewing and sort of like a rambling prescriptive um, medium right here, but that's okay. Um, I'm actually a little nervous to do this since I don't like saying things about stuff that I don't know about. Um, and I don't feel like I'm necessarily an expert in uh, Socratic interviewing or, or, or these concepts, but I do think that uh, there is something valuable here. And I, and I received a request to, to actually talk about this. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so something that uh, um, has come up a lot for me is with, with working with clients or working with coaches and trying to, to teach them to do things the way that I want them to do it is that uh, I often think I know the answers and sometimes I do know the answers in terms of what a client should do or what a coach should do or how to handle a specific situation or why a coach should do a certain thing um, with a client or to lead a class, etc. But the coach or client doesn't do what I want. And um, I used to be much more uh, prescriptive in terms of how I'd approach these things. I'd be like, oh, well, I know the I know the right answer, so I'm just going to tell you. Or potentially argumentative of like, well, why are you doing it this way? It should be this way. Um, and, you know, <laughs> over time you learn that's not always the, the most effective way to, to actually get behavior change in people. So these concepts of Socratic questioning um, have really been helpful for me. So essentially the idea is that uh, by asking pointed questions, you can not only elicit a more detailed uh, response from whoever you're working with, whether that's a, a client or employee or whatever, in terms of what they're actually thinking and what their specific goals are in a situation, but you can also force them to, to clarify their thinking and clarify the assumptions that they're making. And they will often come to the realization that you want them to come to on their own, uh, provided you ask questions that, that kind of lead in the right direction. And it's not always just like a, a manipulative uh, a manipulative tactic or trick to to get someone to do what you want, but it can be, um, a way of, of having someone, you know, engage in an actual dialogue with you as their reasoning, because they may have uh, specific reasons that they're doing something that you don't understand. And then when you do understand that, it's kind of like a, uh, a, a perspective shift for you as well. Um, so in the context of, you know, I, I'm just going to speak from my experience as far as, uh, leading coaches meetings, um, at South Loop strength and conditioning. So we do weekly coaches meetings, which I think is one of the best things that we've implemented as far as improving the quality of the product that we're offering. Um, and this used to be something that was very much like a, a top down information sharing type of scenario where, you know, we would talk about something um, and I and I would kind of go up at the whiteboard and say, all right, great. Like I recently learned about these concepts related to uh, breathing and stabilization. So I'm going to lecture at you and explain them to you. Or, you know, I recently learned about these concepts um, related to specific types of program design and energy systems. And I'm just going to um, write at the whiteboard and, and tell you how to do it. Um, and I think that coaches generally found this somewhat interesting. Um, but I found that it resulted in approximately zero behavior change, uh, which is somewhat strange to me as a, as an individual who spends just thousands and thousands of dollars on continuing education and going to seminars, um, you know, who has, uh, obscene amounts of, of YouTube videos bookmarked to watch. And I watched them at, uh, I, I downloaded a special plugin to watch faster than the, than the two times speed that YouTube will allow you to, to speed things up to, um, you know, reading books and articles and all that kind of stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an individual who, who voraciously consumes information and, uh, ostensibly seems to get something out of it, right. That I, I seemingly am able to take this information and actually integrate it into, um, what I'm doing as far as coaching or running a business, et cetera. Um, and I sort of, uh, foolishly assume that other people behave in a similar way, right. That they, they like information, they want information. And if they're provided information that they can then, um, extract out the principles from it and then apply it. And, um, this isn't necessarily meant to be, um, judgmental or, or anything like that. But the reality is, is that most people can't do that. Um, or they, they don't do that or they don't want to do it, or it's not something that they understand how to do. And maybe, uh, 
a meta skill that they need to be taught. Um, and if that is the case, I certainly don't know how to do it. Um, but in terms of, of actually teaching people how to do things or improving people's thought process surrounding coaching, um, I thought the answer was to do essentially what I did to, to learn to coach, which is, um, a combination of have a bunch of real life experience so be doing the thing and then just be, um, relentlessly consuming information related to it. Um, whenever I could. And, uh, um, again, I saw that this was just not, not terribly effective. And I think that there's, uh, um, there's a subset of people who we can call model builders, right? Where they, they tend to create a model of the world and have a bunch of theories about how it works, um, up and down different layers of abstraction, right? So they have very detailed, um, specific pieces, um, at a very tactical level. And then they have kind of like big picture theories about how things should work. And they're sort of always jumping up and down, um, those different layers and testing their experiences against the, um, the, the predictions of their model. And then when they read something, they sort of are comparing it against the, uh, um, the specific aspect of knowledge that they already have. And they're seeing if it aligns, if it doesn't align, if there needs to be something that needs to be tweaked. Um, if there's something that, uh, is a slow, you know, a subtle alteration of how they actually think about things, or if it's like totally at odds with their own model and that potentially either the thing that they're reading is wrong or their own, um, understanding of how the, the phenomenon works, is, it, the, how the phenomenon works is wrong. And, you know, I think people who do this, can take in a lot of information at seminars or reading articles or watching YouTube videos, and they can actually get something out of it because the entire time that they're, they're taking in this information, they're actively sort of like comparing it to their, to their own model of the world and updating. Right. So they're, it, it I hate terms like active listening, but the, but they're not just, they're not just listening and saying, Oh, wow, that's interesting. They're really thinking through, does this align with my own beliefs, my own prescriptions, my own experiences? Um, I think of this as kind of like, a, if you imagine a transparency, um, which I'm sure doesn't exist uh, in high school anymore, but for me, that was a, a common a common feature of high school classes, right? A transparency. Um, you sort of think about different models of the world as, as, as two different transparencies, and you kind of overlay them on top of each other, and you see where it's different. And where those things are different... Um, you know, that that's where there's, there's something that needs to be, uh, something that needs to be checked on. Right. So it might be something like, um, I don't know what would be a, what would be a relevant example? Well, we'll get a little in the weeds. It's fine. Um, we think about something like a uh, uh, missing thoracic extension, right? That this is a very common thing that people talk about, meaning the ability to extend the upper back um, in various activities. And a lot of individuals are quote unquote missing thoracic extension when they are attempting to put their arms over their head. So they have a hard time achieving a good range of motion with their arms over their head. And the, the sort of conventional wisdom here is that, you know what, you're missing thoracic extension. Um, let's actually mobilize you into extension. This is what we need to do. We can do this with a foam roller and a kettlebell and, um, you know, lacrosse balls and all that kind of stuff, which those things are actually effective. Um, which is, which is pretty interesting given that I think that the, the model of missing thoracic extension is somewhat incorrect. Um, and you know, maybe a more subtle way of looking at it is that you're not missing thoracic extension because you're trapped in flexion. You're missing thoracic extension because your thoracic spine is already locked into an extended position such that it cannot extend any more when you try to extend it, uh, which is somewhat difficult to, to parse potentially in an audio format. But, um, you know, the idea that I, uh, that I used in, in terms of explaining this previously was like a, a door that, um, is open all the way. You can't open that door anymore. Right. Um, so if, if you're, if you're thinking about the thoracic spine, like a door, if the door is trapped, um, in a closed position, right, you need to sort of like unstick it so it can open. Um, but if the door is open all the way, um, you're not able to actually open the door anymore because there, there's nowhere else for it to go. Um, so if we think about this concept of, you know, missing thoracic extension, it could either be that someone is locked in flexion or someone is in too much extension. And if you have a model of the world of how this actually works, you're able to sort of compare your reference experiences to different theories and potentially iterate over time to say, you know what, maybe all these people are not locked in flexion, but they're actually locked in extension and the stuff that we're doing that's effective, like foam rolling and lacrosse balls, et cetera, um, may actually be effective, not for the reason that we thought it was. It's not because it's mobilizing them into extension. It's because it's giving different, um, proprioceptive feedback and, um, sort of like 
you know, prodding various tissues uh, in this area that has some sort of altered movement mechanics. And then based upon that, we're able to potentially get the thoracic spine into a more neutral position, which then allows further extension, right? And then uh, you know, we're really kind of getting, getting lost in the weeds on this specific area. But the idea here is that some people actually have models of the world that they're updating constantly, and then they're able to sort of, um, think through how these things work and compare it to the reference experiences and change it. Um, whereas other people just kind of have a, uh, a collection of, of random rules and, and intuitions, uh, that, aren't necessarily being updated. So they're just kind of like a hodgepodge of, of different rules for different situations. Uh, but it's not cohesive and they don't necessarily understand which layer of abstraction they're actually working on. Right. Meaning, um, you know, is this potentially a, a motor control issue? Is this something that's like a very specific joint mobility issue? Is this a technique issue? Um, you know, that, that all those things are different layers where there can be different problems. And there's usually one that is going to be sort of like the dominant area where something needs to be fixed. Um, so all that to say, uh, you know, my, my assumption was that just by presenting information that people would take it in, update their models of the world, and then sort of go forth and, uh, uh, and do what I wanted. And I found this to be very false. Um, so, I've, I've definitely switched the way that I run coaches meetings, um, and a lot of client interaction to be much more, again, to, to use the, the term Socratic, uh, in terms of the way that, that I approach it, because I'm much more interested in what people are thinking and how they're thinking about it. Um, and then having them sort of reason through things on their own so that they're, they are attempting to create and update their own models rather than having me just sort of, uh, vomit information at them as I'm sort of doing in this, um, this podcast right now. Um, so the idea uh, is essentially, you know, th that people are not going to solve problems that they don't know that they have, right? So um, if, if someone doesn't know that they have a, a problem with, let's call it um, assessing upper body mobility in clients, they don't really care about your theories surrounding thoracic flexion and extension or how the scapula should move, et cetera. Um, but if people do recognize that, they're, that there's a problem there, then they're much more open to the idea of having a, a, a potentially more advanced model of the world explained to them, or just, you know, giving them sort of a, a, let's call it baby steps as far as, okay, you're just thinking of things in terms of you need to mobilize into thoracic extension. Well, let's add in the scapula here. Can you understand and think about how the scapula should be moving on the rib cage, you know, and, and that's potentially another uh, degree of complexity and degree of freedom in terms of how you actually think about these problems. Uh, and then based upon that, you may be able to um, start to recognize uh, more complexity in terms of when you're coaching clients, and then you start to see more different problems, and then you're able to kind of level up from there. So by asking these sort of uh, uh, these pointed questions, meaning like, you know, why do you think that's the case? What assumptions are you making to, um, to come to that conclusion? Uh, was that effective? Did that work? Is there anything else you could have tried, et cetera? Um, you're really forcing people to kind of explore their own models rather than just kind of relying on, on random rules of like, oh, well, you know, your backgrounds when you deadlift, you need to stretch your hamstrings. Um, you know, oh, you know, your, uh, um, your, your shoulder kind of gets irritated, uh, when you put your arms over your head must be bicep tendonitis or biceps tendonitis. Right. And it's like, yeah, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes there, there is, a uh, um, a, a tension issue in the hamstrings when someone rounds their back on the deadlift, but there's a lot of other things that it could be. And a lot of other things that it probably is first. Um, so, you know, just, just really getting people to, to number one, um, explain what their problems are. And then, uh, number two, uh, get them to explain how they attempt to deal with them. And then number three, to really probe them with different types of questions to have them clarify how they're thinking about things. Uh, I found this to be much, 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 much more effective as far as actually getting behavior change. So to give an example of how this, uh, potentially works in our coaches meetings, we will do, um, at the beginning of our meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll randomly select a coach and have them share something that they struggled with um, over the last week, right? This could be coaching a client. It could be like a, a potential emotional issue with a client. It could be uh, potentially a, a, a movement or mobility issue. It could be difficulty explaining a certain prescription, et cetera. And so um, once that, that issue is sort of on the table, um, everyone has uh, an actual 
like real life anchor to sort of hang the discussion from. So rather than being like, here's this theoretical discussion on the mechanics of thoracic flexion and extension and how um, different, you know, common asymmetrical patterns are related to uh, these potential issues in CrossFit athletes, which like, who cares? Uh, but it's like, I was trying to get this client to achieve a proper front rack position and they couldn't do it. And I tried this, 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 and this, and they still couldn't do it. And they started to get frustrated. Um, everyone in the room sort of understands, um, you know, what, what that feels like and what that problem is. So we have a real life example to actually hang any sort of discussion off of, which makes a huge difference. Right. And then we have an actual, um, you know, decision tree flow chart of how this coach attempted to deal with that specific problem. So then they're um, talking through the reasoning, they're talking through what they tried, they're talking through what didn't work. And then based upon that, um, you know, my role in a lot of these discussions is, is to just kind of ask probing questions and keep it moving, right? Um, and what I would have done, you know, a few years ago is just be like, oh, well, here's the problem, you need to do this, 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 and this, it should have been like that cool. Any questions? Great. Let's move on. Um, and that's just not helpful at all, right? That, um, coaches don't learn anything. Um, you become like the quote unquote guru. So it's like, Oh wow. Yeah. Like he's so smart, but that's not helpful for anyone because, uh, no one else actually learns how to do that stuff. And then people become sort of like dependent on you or feel fearful of you to actually explain, um, how things work and, and why they should do things. So just a, a totally ineffective way to actually get people to become better. Right. Um, so to, to sort of circle back to this example of the, this client struggling with the front rack, you know, we talk through, okay, what did you try? What would everyone else have tried? Why would you try that? What assumptions did you make about trying that? What expectation do you have about how much they would potentially get better? Um, you know, did the client understand? Did the client have any feedback? Um, does the client have any idea of what they think is potentially the problem as well? Because that can totally change things too, right? That if you're trying to work with a client and they don't understand that they have the problem that you think that they have, you know, you're 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 beating your head against the wall and not going anywhere. Uh, so by going through this process of just asking a bunch of questions, um, you know, it can, it can be pretty annoying because sometimes <laughs> you, you can tell uh, that I, for example, have something I'm trying to get people to say, right? That I, I want them to offer a certain suggestion or I want them to go in a certain direction. Uh, and if they're not doing it, I just keep asking like kind of dumb open-ended questions like, well, is there, is there anything else that could be the issue? Or like, what about this? Um, and at some point, you know, it, it probably is, it probably is worth it to just sort of jump in and say, Hey, you know what? Like, here's what I think may be the actual issue or here's something to try. Um, but ideally at that point, you know, by, by going through the, the, the discussion, having everyone explain their own thought process and their own reasoning and coming up with different ideas, um, potentially writing some stuff on the board, uh, drawing diagrams, you know, having, having coaches do all these different things that at that point, everyone has like a pretty robust idea of what we're actually talking about, right? It's not this sort of like haphazard collection of, of different intuitions and, and gut feelings and, and random rules of like, oh yeah, like just make sure you stretch your hamstrings. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit more, uh, complex and nuanced in terms of how people are thinking about it. So there, there is a model that has been built in the room, uh, during the discussion process of how things work and why they work and what might be a valuable direction to go in. So then if I do come in and say, okay, well, guess what guys, like, here's how you should think about thoracic flexion and extension. Like everyone thinks this, but blah, blah, blah. Um, and then based upon that, you know, the, the, the actual, um, real life example and the understanding that has been built through discussion gives context to a theory, which then potentially makes it much more applicable. Right. Um, once again, a lot of people like they just giving random theories and, uh, rambling on different examples and, uh, getting in the weeds on, you know, why certain common thought processes are wrong. is just like not really, not really a terribly effective way, um, to actually get things, to actually get things changed and to get, to get people, um, understanding things better. So through the process of these, um, Socratic questions, right? These, these clarifying questions, these sort of pointed questions, uh, we're essentially 
forcing people to engage in the process of model building, right? Again, I think there are some individuals who do this very intuitively, um, that they they think through uh, the different implications of their theories. They make sure that they actually make sense with the, uh, uh, the real life examples that they have. They update them based upon new information. They challenge them with, um, with expert information. And they're, they're kind of engaged in this process independent of anything else that's going on. But for other people, this has to be uh, sort of created um, in an environment of these types of questions, right? And that, that becomes much more effective then for actually driving the, um, the ability of individuals to, to better understand things and change their behavior because they are then repeatedly forced into this environment, which, which in and of itself becomes a skill, right? Is that when you're doing this consistently on a week over week basis where it's like, all right, I know that someone is going to come with some sort of problem and then I'm going to get asked all these questions. And, you know, if I say something, I better have some sort of explanation for it. Or, um, you know, if I, if I'm making assumptions, I really do need to, to think about what assumptions I'm making, uh, when I make a statement that, 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 that those, those cognitive habits that come from this repeated uh, process of going through Socratic questioning um, in and of themselves make people better at their craft, right? In this case, we're talking about coaching. And it's not like someone is going to be um, coaching an individual on a snatch and, you know, they see that they, whatever, swing the bar out and they're going to be like, well, what assumptions am I making to 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 decide that they swung the bar out, right? Like it's not going to happen like that. But uh, by having these, these cognitive habits going of, understanding the types of questions that you should be prepared to answer when you make a statement or um, the types of questions that you should ask yourself when you are potentially uh, frustrated or stuck that over time uh, that becomes a cognitive skill in and of itself, which then makes people more capable of potentially um, doing engaging in these model building behaviors on their own um, rather than just having this be something that is kind of like forced, <laughs> forced on them in these, uh, um, in these coaches meetings. So I think one of the other things that's, uh, that's important to discuss when we're talking about Socratic questioning is the, um, I guess the nuance of the, uh, of the social, the, the social implications of, of asking these kinds of questions, right. Um, within our coaches meetings, for example, I think everyone sort of knows that like, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to, you know, cut people off if they're rambling and ask clarifying questions. And I'm going to, um, have something that I'm trying to, some sort of direction I'm trying to lead things in, but I'm not just going to tell people. Um, and you know, based upon that, uh, people are, are, are pretty good sports with it. And I, th I, I think that people at least kind of like the, the process of going through these different, uh, exercises and reasoning through things. But, you know, especially when working with clients where, it, it, it can be valuable to do this, but maybe not in quite as a, I guess we'll call it pedantic way as, as I might be doing, or like a, a law school professor might do. Um, but, but all these things do require an element of genuine curiosity rather than sort of like a, a, a disdainful, sarcastic knowing, right? So uh, I think it's a combination, uh, if we stick with our coaches meetings, of me having something that I, uh, that I want to happen, right. A direction I want the discussion to go. Um, some points that I want to make sure are brought up, uh, some clarifications that I want to make sure are made, um, as well as a genuine curiosity in terms of how coaches actually think about things. Right. So for example, um, so one of the, one of the things that can frustrate me is when coaches are letting people get away with what I consider to be poor movement, right that there is, there, there are plenty of, of valid reasons to not, uh, just hammer a client repeatedly with corrections, right? Sometimes people sort of hit an emotional tipping point or if you keep, just keep hammering them with corrections, um, they're going to get frustrated. You're going to lose them. Uh, you know, potentially they have some sort of, uh, movement patterning issue that, you know, you're not going to fix in the environment of a specific session. So you, you've sort of weighed the options and decided that they're not a safety risk and it's not worth it to just keep, you know, hammering this individual. Uh, if you know that they potentially have like a, a, an issue with creating hip flexion and their, their squats aren't to full depth. Um, you know, maybe you're prioritizing something else with them. Um, you've really worked hard on getting them to, uh, let's say initiate the squat at the hip, um, rather than just at the knee. And they're, they're doing a pretty good job of it, but their heels are still coming off the ground, like crazy in the bottom of the squat. You may decide that, you know what, like we've made some progress today on this one specific area. And I'm not interested in <laughs> overwhelming this person with more corrections and making them feel like they failed when they actually did a pretty good job of taking a step forward in terms of their movement, right? All kinds of reasons to potentially, um, 
leave someone alone on a movement quality issue. Um, but you know, I, I still, I still can see it happen, uh, in classes and I get frustrated where I'm like, why are you letting this person do this? Like you have to do something about it. Uh, but I, but I'm curious, like I'm not just mad and I'm not just disdainful. I'm not sarcastic. I want to know why, why are you letting this person do this? Um, and sometimes the answers are, are surprising, right? Sometimes it's not what you'd expect. Uh, something that has come up often is, um, especially with, uh, people who are drop-ins, uh, meaning visitors from out of town. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there, there's some element of selection bias in terms of people who are going to go out of their way to train when they are uh, in a foreign city and go to a different gym are probably people who are are, are highly motivated to exercise, uh, which is probably also correlated with people who are like sort of stubborn and hard charging. So uh, the the percentage of drop-ins who react badly to coaching uh, is is relatively high. It's not like massively high, but but there's a uh, there's definitely a difference in terms of drop-ins versus normal class members. Right, drop-ins come in with expectations of how things should be done. They have their own culture at their gym. They may not have an awareness of how different gyms operate. They're probably the most most, uh, motivated and stubborn and potentially disagreeable people, um, since they're willing to sort of throw themselves into, um, you know, potentially uncomfortable situations and some percentage of drop-ins just sort of lash out at coaches who correct them or it's like, Hey, like maybe you should try doing it this way. And they're like, Oh, well at my gym, we do it this way. And, you know, after having enough bad experiences with trying to coach drop-ins, some coaches just sort of like, you know what, like, I'm going to try to help the drop-in, but I'm just going to, you know, soft pedal around them and, and, and not, and not push too hard on it. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that that's an, an unreasonable, uh, reaction to, to the dynamics of the situation, right? Other things can just be coaches being super frustrated because they've given the same cue repeatedly to an individual. That person hasn't listened. Um, and they feel like their options are that they're, that they're being, you know, actively disrespected and, and ignored. And, uh, they'd rather leave that person alone than potentially create some sort of altercation because they, they don't necessarily trust themselves to uh, be neutral when giving feedback, right? So again, there's there's potential solutions to these problems, but it, it might not be what I would think as far as why coaches are letting people get away with stuff. So um, a genuine curiosity in terms of, you know, well, why do you think that? What do you think is going on with that? What are things that you could have tried? Um, and if there is that element of curiosity, you know, people can feel that and th they may be able to tell, obviously, that you are, are engaging in some sort of like uh, strategic questioning of their decision making process. But, um, you know, you're much likely to much more likely to have uh, a productive and fruitful discussion if you are able to, to make these questions much more neutral um, and curious. Same thing with clients, right? Because clients can get irritated with you if you're like being a weirdo and, and just like asking all these leading questions and never saying anything. And they're like, yo, like you're my coach and I hired you to kind of tell me what to do. So tell me what to do. Um, although Go, going through the, the questioning process and sort of making them ask you can be a good way to get buy-in, right? Because people don't necessarily want prescription. They don't want to do what their, what their dad tells them. Like, you know, leave, leave me alone, dad. Um, but the idea of, of having a client actually ask for a specific prescription rather than just sort of throwing it at them um, can be a great way to get buy-in, right? Uh, it's, it's much more effective when someone either comes to a conclusion on their own, potentially comes to a conclusion through um, some sort of, you know, guided questioning process or specifically says, hey, I don't know what to do in this situation. Please tell me, um, you know, you're going to have much better uh, adoption and, and, and compliance rates based upon that rather than just being like, oh, well, you know, I see that you did this, this, this and this. Uh, the the problem is clearly that, you know, you're inconsistent with your your nutrition plan and you, you eat out on weekends and don't track your macros, like stop doing that. Um, um, and you know, if that client is like, well, guess what? And like I, <laughs> I'm, I'm in sales, um, and all of my, um, you know, networking opportunities and, uh, opportunities to actually push my, push my career forward are at these weekend events. And I need to actually engage in these, these, um, client dinners and all that kind of stuff without being the weirdo who's like bringing, bringing Tupperware to, uh, um, some sort of restaurant or something like screw you, I'm not doing it. Uh, you know, you've, you, you, you've, you've really lost the ability to actually, uh, connect with that client. If you give them a, a prescription that, that indicates that you're out of touch with what they, what the, what the realities of their life are and what they're willing and unwilling to do. 
And people will just tune you out at that point too. You know, they'll just get, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, but by engaging in some sort of questioning process, you, you are potentially able to um, understand what their decision-making criteria are and why they're doing things. And then maybe uh, come up with some sort of, um, you know, solution that is, that is actually helpful for everyone. So um, to wrap up on this, again, <laughs> ironic podcast where I'm being prescriptive about the process of um, Socratic questioning, uh, I think that the, the big thing here is that understanding how to help people actually model the world is, is what we're after, right? We're, we're after the idea of asking questions that force people to really clarify why they're doing things, what assumptions they're making and how they're coming to their conclusions rather than just allowing them to rely on uh, kind of random tactics and intuitions and rules that they've um, pieced together from experience or from something that they were told once when they, you know, in our case, first started coaching. Um, and that by going through the process of asking all these questions all the time, uh, you know, we're able to then create opportunities for people to, to share information and, and really give insight into why they're doing what they're doing. And then based upon that, um, you know, as a, as a manager in this case or whatever, if you do come in and are prescriptive or want to explain something, uh, that ideally, you know, your, your staff will, will actually understand, uh, what the, what the relevance is and they're able to, to relate it to their experience. And you, as someone who is then delivering a message are able to, um, alter the message based upon what the, uh, what the reality is for your staff, right? You, you understand why they're doing what they're doing. You understand where their thought process is at. You understand the barriers that they have. So you can then give uh, a prescription to them or, or an explanation to them that actually makes sense rather than just being like some, you know, out of touch theoretical, um, you know, non real world example. Um, again, sort of like this podcast. Um, and then when, when applying this stuff to clients as well, it's very similar, right? It, by, by asking these pointed questions, you're able to, to really help clients clarify where their sticking points are, uh, and why they're, why they're potentially not following through in the way that they should be, or what, what the reality is as far as like, okay, well, if you want to, to really take the next step, as far as body composition change, like, here's what might be required. Are you willing and prepared to do that? You know, if you want to take some, the next step as far as performance, well, you know, you're training this much per week. And the reality is, is the people, the people who you want to compete with are training this much per week. And, um, there may be ways that you can be more efficient or, or whatever, but like, you know, is, is there a way that you can move forward or are you okay with not actually taking that next step and, and sort of sticking where you're at, um, relative to the competitive field. So, um, hopefully, uh, those concepts are helpful. Hopefully everyone listening to this is a, is a quote unquote model builder. So you're able to take, um, abstract theoretical rambling and, uh, potentially hook it into, hook it into real life experience and, uh, create some, create some behavior change with it. Thanks for listening all the way through. I admire your grit, your persistence, and your perseverance. Since you made it, I have a few favors to ask of you. Go ahead and open up the show notes on whatever podcast player you use. In there, you'll find links to all the resources that were mentioned throughout the show. There's also some links there in which you can leave a review or subscribe to the show. And podcasters are always harping on this because this actually makes a difference in terms of the algorithms that recommend podcasts to new people. So if you do that, it helps more people find the show. And if you head over to toddneef.com, you can sign up to receive most of my thoughts and writing, which really only go out to the email list. A lot of it never makes it to the blog or the podcast. So if you like what I have to say and you want to see some of my recommendations and stuff that I've been checking out, go ahead and subscribe to that email newsletter as well.